1 Thessalonians chapter 2 at verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It, uh, it differs somewhat if you're reading from the New International Version, but uh, I like it better, especially at this passage. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. And let's pause and pray. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of your children be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You will honor our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. It's not as clear in the New International and some of the other translations how strongly this first verse connects back to what's been said in chapter 1. I would reference our teaching from last week to catch up, but uh, this is basically a continuation. I'm not sure why the church felt the need to split it right here because for you yourselves know uh, is really talking about uh, what Paul is saying in verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. They is referencing back to uh, the people in Macedonia and Achaia. Uh, verse 7, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia. Verse 9, for they themselves declare concerning us. Verse 1, chapter 2, for you yourselves know. I mean, all this is pointing to specific people, to specific examples at specific times. And, and the reference, again, uh, this is the oldest of Paul's letter, which means it's probably the first or at least one of the first books of the New Testament as far as age. And so this is really getting back to the cutting edge of the New Testament. Now, other passages in the New Testament reference back to times earlier than this, but they were written later, and they were written based on human memory. And if you're like me, you've grown to, to distrust human memory. But now, I mean, these people were storytellers, and, and so the stories have become somewhat set. But if you want to get back to the earliest this is the earliest, and, and uh, Paul is referencing how the gospel gets shared out. As I mentioned last week, we have the founding of this referenced in Acts chapter 17, and, and uh, he's going to make reference here in a minute to something that happened in Acts 16 that, that I'll want us to look at, but it all has to do with how the gospel gets shared. My personal opinion is if there ever was a time the church needs to know how to share the gospel, it's today. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that come, becomes exceedingly clear is it's done in boldness in spite of opposition. Opposition doesn't tamp it down. For Paul and for Silas and Timothy, opposition seems to just fan it into flame. And in fact, they count opposition to the gospel as one of the signs that the gospel is taking root, taking hold. I remember this has been in a previous century and a previous county and a previous church a long time ago. I'm the only one that remembers this story. But uh, a fella repeatedly opposed me in leadership in the church, and he came unannounced one night to my home and uh, basically said, I'm quitting the church and I kept trying to find out what's going on, what's going on, why are you quitting the church? Uh, a young man had young children in the church. He and his wife were raising their children in the church, but he was constantly opposing me. And he just finally said, well, I quit. Just, just mark me off. And I'm thinking, well, I can't mark you off because technically you've never joined. <laughs> And without thinking about that, I said, you've never been baptized. A few minutes later, he's back beating on my door saying, can you baptize me? I said, when? He said, now. <laughs> strangely enough, strangely enough, that church had a full baptismal font. I mean, baptistry, not just a font, but a baptistry. Strangely enough, it was already full. Coincidence. Wow. A coincidence purely because that only would have happened every couple of years but that night it was full 
we called a worship service that night mm. because he insisted, I have to be baptized tonight. And it, it, it broke him. But, but had there not been some sense of opposition, in this case, me, when he said, strike me off the roll, I said, well, you've never been baptized. I didn't say you're not a member of the church. I said, you've never been baptized. And uh, that, for whatever reason, the gospel accentuated that in his heart and it had to be right now. It was from full opposition to full inclusion, submission, submission good word, submission. So uh, this is the case here, and it's talking back about the things that have happened, how the church at Thessalonica has uh, received the message in spite of the opposition there and prior, and how they themselves have now become spreaders of the gospel. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. The word vain there is kenosis. It means empty. Uh, that passage in Philippians 2 where it talks about uh, he emptied himself of all that would make him equal to God. The word there is kenosis. And so it's this idea of being poured out. And he's saying our gospel, the, it, it, the, the sharing uh, this preaching was not poured out. It's not empty. CDB says waste of time. Wait. <laughs> it wasn't a waste of time. It was not a waste of time. It accomplished. And see, that's the point is they're looking beyond the immediate. They're looking towards what God is doing, and God has a better understanding of what's happening. So our job is just to keep sharing the gospel in such a way that we're not letting opposition stop us. But even, now, we'll pause there. Verse 2, it's not going to be in the NIV. I did not think to check the CEV. Does it start with the word but or yet? On the contrary. On the contrary. All right, good. Uh, the word there, he's going to make use of a word that translates as yet or but. The, the King James and the New King James is going to say but, and he's going to do it three or four times. And every time you hear him do that, it's alos. And it, 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 it's, it's a strong uh, adversative. It, it, it contradicts what has been going on by, by, the, pub, by the public, by the opposition. It's, uh, it's like the preacher preaching a sermon, and he, he says, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's that kind of but. And it's, it's God's not finished yet. But even after we suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi. Now, that's where I want us to flip back to Acts 16. Last week, we looked at Acts 17. You don't have to turn there if you trust me to read the passage. <laughs> Acts 17, at verse 1, we hear how uh, the church at Thessalonica is, is, is founded. But flipping back, we hear about Paul and Silas in Philippi. And at verse 25 is one of my favorite verses, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now what has happened? They've already been beaten with rods. They've been imprisoned. They're hanging from chains. And at midnight, what are they doing? They're singing hymns. And the prisoners were listening to them. The prisoners were thinking, are these guys crazy? You've got to be crazy. You've been beaten. The multitudes, verse 22, rose up together against them. The magistrates tore off their clothes, clothes, commanded them to be beaten with rods, and they had many stripes laid on them. They threw them in prison, and at midnight, verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed, and so on and so forth, until the Philippian jailer, and his entire family get saved and are baptized that night. But even after we had suffered these things, going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, even after we suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, he's referencing history, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God. Now, Paul is saying, we're not making this up. When we, when we came to you, you could still see where the rods had beaten us. I'm told that that was more painful and long-lasting than being beaten with whips. 
uh, that it would bruise the bones. It would bruise the bones and it would be deep and it would take, you know, a year or better to get over. We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Now, that, that final phrase, in much conflict, the NIV translates that as in strong opposition. How does yours read there at the end of uh, verse 2, Jim? A lot of opposition. A lot of opposition. So whatever this strong opposition is, from here on out for the rest of this stu study, look at the opposite of what Paul is going to say as being that which is coming from strong opposition. From here on, Paul's going to remind them how he and Silas or Silvanus, depending on your translation, and Timothy came. They came one way, the strong opposition came the other way. You get to decide which way you like best in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanliness. All right, now that's the strong opposition. The opposition has to be Judaism because it's the unclean, uncleanliness. You know, it's, you know, the, the Jews are saying, they're not really Jewish. They're, you know, they've, they've gone unclean. <laughs> the worst thing that could happen to uh, uh, a Gentile. And so uh, to a Jew is become as a Gentile. So it's not in error or uncleanliness, nor was it in deceit. But there's the second strong but. Or if you want to translate yet, it's a strong adversative. Yet, as we have been approved by God. What's the opposite of being approved by God? Approved by man. So he's saying this strong opposition. Yeah, they've got people's approval. Who approves us? God, because you've seen God at work in us. Even after we'd suffered and were spitefully used at Philippi, mm -hmm. we came in strength, and boy, you could tell. Mm -hmm. Approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God. Again, it's that strong adversative, but God who tests our hearts. All right, why does Paul get his heart tested? As God who tests our hearts. Purity is a moment by moment thing. Uh, somebody decades ago just played with my mind royally when they said it's easy to be a Christian martyr as opposed to being a Christian saint. A Christian martyr only has to make that decision once. A Christian saint, it's moment by, it's not even every day, it's, it's moment by moment. I mean, I can, I can do wonderful and 30 seconds later, just stick my foot in my mouth up into the ankle and just be. So God is, is walking with me to test my heart, not in such a way that he's waiting just for me to mess up and slam me. But now how does it go in Hebrews? Those whom God loves, he chastens, he corrects. And so this God who tests our heart is the God that makes sure that I have the ability to walk straight. Because when I mess up, he chastens me, I feel it in my spirit, I do what I can to correct the error, but I ask forgiveness. All right, now there's three things that uh, Paul is going to deny he used in the preaching to the Thessalonians. And by the denial, you see that that was probably the charge placed against them by this strong opposition. For neither at any time did we use one, flattering words. Now the words there is referencing specifically the preaching the gospel, because the gospel is preached in words, and and the flattering words, we, we didn't manipulate you. Uh, this is a good point to watch out for. When the preacher starts by, you know, everything's lovely and you're just so wonderful, you know, am I being manipulated? I tend to take things to extreme. 
it's very common when you're invited to preach somewhere that you start off thanking the congregation and especially thanking the pastor. And if you have any relationship with the pastor, you really build them up. I don't do that. I barely say my name is Earl and I start into the gospel immediately. Why? I cannot stand the idea that maybe I've used flattering words in order to manipulate people. And so I start as, strong, as quick as I can, if I'm invited to preach anywhere, as quick as I can, I get to the gospel, I stay in the gospel, I don't leave the gospel. And Paul said, we didn't use flattering words. That was, oh yeah, Paul, he was just sucking up to y'all and manipulating. No, no. As you know, nor a cloak for covetousness. Now that's the second thing. Jim, I'm curious to see what your translation reads there. Greedy motives. Greedy motives. NIV says a mask for greed. Now, from here on, one of the subtle contexts is going to be money. It's common knowledge that Philippi has given money to the ministry. And, and that will be a charge uh, that comes up from time and again, and it's going to be addressed today very, very subtly. But also at the same time, if you know what he's talking about, it's clear. And that Paul is saying, you know, um, I had a right that I chose not to use. And I did it intentionally. And it was done for love. A cloak, nor a cloak for covetousness. Now, verse 5, he's going to talk about money. Verse 9, he's going to say, Remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. That not being a burden to you is, we earned our own way. We didn't, you know, we had the right not to have to work. Now, what was, what was Paul's daytime job? Tent maker. Tent maker. Leather one. Did he work in leather? Well, a tent maker, but yeah, that that was a leather worker. And 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 the thing is, he's still at this point evidently doing it because this reference is we were not a burden to you. He's earning his money somehow. Either other people are supporting him from somewhere else as a missionary, or he's still working. All right. But this the strong subcontext here is going to be money for the rest of this passage nor a cloak for covetousness. God is witness. That's the strongest oath he can make. God is witness. Third, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. So uh, our standing before people was never the motivation. <laughs>
it's passages like that that make me think because he hasn't been joined by Simon Peter or anybody else. It's just he and Silas and Timothy. And so we, Silas and Timothy included, as an apostle of Christ. Now, again, apostle doesn't technically mean someone who has met Jesus. Apostle, and it's originally, original Greek understanding is someone who is sent out to represent someone else. And the, the closest word we have in the English that's in common usage is ambassador. And they're ambassadors for the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. Now, some people want to say that's restricted to those early apostles. No, anybody that goes out and has that kind of ministry where they're introducing the gospel for the first time, not in America, but there are still places in the world where you are the first representative of a foreign kingdom, the kingdom of God. And in those places, it's an apostolic ministry. All right, enough of that. But we were gentle among you, verse 7. Just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Now, verse 7 and 8, Paul is mixing his metaphors so dramatically that honestly, there's no good way of translating it. Everybody's going to take one approach or the other. But it's just going to be, we know he's talking about nursing. We know he's talking about children. We know he's talking about mothers. But in the Greek, with it all being run on and without there being commas and periods, and he doesn't have paragraphs. All of that run on. We're not sure at which time Paul is the child and which time he's the mother. But this is the way the New King James, we do know, that he's expressing the love that comes as child and nursing mother. And is a mother ever as close to a baby as when the mother is nursing the baby? We were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. That is an expression of love. However, however your translation chooses to render that, that is such a strong expression of love. The only way it could be understood is a nursing mother to a child. Uh, again, it, at times it seems like Paul wants to be the child and Paul wants to be the mother. but. However it comes across, this is the motivation for what Paul does. Jim, you want to read us yours? We were glad to share not only God's good news with you, but, but, but also our very lives because we cared for you so much. Yeah. You had become dear to us. And see, that's the motive of the gospel. It has to be that, that those that proclaim the gospel do so in love. And the motivation has got to be lived out. It's not so much what you say. You can have a great pulpiteer. And, and without that motivation of true love, it'd be wasted. It'd be empty. Now, we're, we're supposed to cut off at verse 8. I'm going to go ahead and include verse 9 because I think it goes back to the motivation about not taking money. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preached to you the gospel of God. And so again, I believe that's speaking to the love issue, but I think it's also speaking to the fact that the night and day, laboring night and day, half of the day was spent in, 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 in proclamation of the gospel, half the day, waking day, was spent in uh, earning our daily bread. Now that, by the way, was a strong pharisaical um, practice. The day was divided into three. Eight hours a day you studied Torah. Eight hours a day you earned your own living. Even if you were wealthy from inheritance, uh, Pharisees were still expected to work. There was no such thing as a, a person of leisure. 
and then in eight hours a day you did anything else including sleep and so you know we labored night and day uh, Paul is continuing this strong tradition from Judaism of how he, he lives it out All right. this is this is my understanding of the text have we got other thoughts or questions comments again uh, just reminding you from last week uh, when we were reading Acts 17 we saw that he preached for three Sabbaths and then he was run out of town and we don't know how much time there's between the three Sabbaths and run out of town but his reference here to how we preach uh, how, how, how we labored night and day this has got to be more than a month this has got to be several months because how else could they get the example of laboring among you night and day and again that night and day it starts with night and day because that's how Genesis begins when Genesis tells time, it's never day and night, it's always night and day. And from Genesis on, you've got the day starting at night. But that's again, comments. Do y'all need to add anything? Father, we give you thanks for your word. But if it stays a written page, it does no good to your community. Let this word live and live in us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.